It will be in the 15th chapter, beginning at the 50th verse and working through to the 58th verse. And you can use your bulletin, which I would ask you to, uh, or your Bibles uh, to work through. And if you want to jot some notes down, please feel free. As we look at the gospel passage today, um, we see that we have the Canaanite woman uh, from Matthew 15, and she has come to the region crying to Jesus, have mercy on me, for my daughter is possessed with a demon. Now, that is something that uh, many of us might have cried out for our teenagers at times when they looked as if they all... Um, chaos was occurring. Uh, But in this case, to be honest with you, uh, this woman's daughter is possessed with a demon. And uh, the disciples say, uh, send her away. She's nagging. She's complaining. All this stuff is going on. And Jesus looks at her and says, your faith, oh lady, your faith, For your faith, your daughter's illness, demon, will be removed. For those of us that know the power of the cross, know the power of Jesus, this is not a surprise, is it? It is not a surprise whatsoever. But for the world, and maybe a few of you skeptics in here today, are going, really? Can Jesus do that? Well, in our study, as we look at 1 Corinthians, we're going to see again and again uh, how Jesus has won. And in chapter 15, verses 50 through 58, we're going to look at that victory. We're going to look at that power. And today's sermon is entitled, The Victory Jesus Christ Has Won in the Resurrection. A couple of weeks ago, you heard me say that my favorite service was what? Funerals. I love funerals. Because we get to proclaim at that time the power of the resurrection to people who are in pain and wondering and trying to figure it out. Last week, Stephen preached about uh, the resurrection of the body. And as he preached about the resurrection of the body, he said, we're not going to have bodies that look like this. And I know mine's not, because I'm going to have hair and abs. (laughs) Long, curly, blonde hair once again. I'm not going to need hair and abs in heaven. Come on. And nor will you, for we'll be given new bodies. And thank God they're not going to look like this. So as we turn to this passage, as we're looking at today, Paul is going to tell us some things. But first of all, I want to tell you some things. I hate to break it to you. But you came in this world one way and you're going out another way. Has anybody found an escape yet? C.S. Lewis says this in his book, The Weight of Glory. 100% of us die. And the percentage cannot be increased. Stephen Ulm, who wrote a really great commentary on 1 Corinthians, says this, and some of you understand it all too well, death is traumatic. Death is obscene. It is counter to everything that is living. Death is ugly. It is painful. It is sad. It is brutal. brutal. It is terrible. It is an aberration. It is terrifying. Death is absolutely not natural. Death doesn't give us any options. 
but yet in Adam, we will all die. Yet in Christ, we'll all be raised to eternity. I don't know about you, but I need to make a confession. We all fight against death. How many of you have had surgery or a procedure that has hopefully increased your life? May they be stents. Uh, May they be other uh, surgeries that have increased your life. You have received them. I hate to break it to you. Only for a short time. How many of you are on strict, stringent dietary regimes in hopes that it will lengthen your life? My staff makes so much fun of me because I eat these, these shakes. Fried clams do not count. <laughs> I eat these shakes that I'm telling you what, oh man, they look horrible. But God, I feel good after them. We all are trying to lengthen our lives one way or the other. You know, I just didn't ride 50 miles on my bike yesterday just for the fun of it, right? And many of you exercise. How many of you exercise one way, shape, or the other? How many of you wish you did? You know, there were more that wished they did than said they did. We all want to somehow lengthen our lives and stay physically fit. And Lamont states this who is a novelist and and quite hilarious at times. Perfectionism is based on the obsessive belief that if you run carefully enough, hitting each stepping stone just right, you won't have to die. The truth is that you will die anyway, and a lot of the people who aren't even looking at their feet are going to do a whole lot better than you and have a lot more fun while doing it. We all fight death one way, shape, or the other. Paul sums up his teaching to the Corinthians in resurrection in one way. He says this to them, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God, and I will have to say, thanks be to God. Because if flesh and blood, this up here, is going to achieve that, that's no fun. That's not very exciting. However, When we take a look at the shape of the cross, living from the cross, let's remember using some of the language that Paul would have used as you read about perishability and imperishability and mortality and immortality. Let's use that when we talk about the shape of the cross. And it'll all put it in light for you. The shape of the cross is like this. The imperishable one, who is Jesus Christ, becomes perishable. You got that? The one who was immortal becomes mortal. The one who has all of life within himself, all power within himself, gives it up to come to earth, to take on perishability. You and I, as in Adam, all are perishable. We can be placed on a compost pile and be reused. We are perishable. But it is Christ's death on the cross who takes your sin, your perishability, 
your mortality upon him, upon the cross, and it is sacrificed on the cross. And as that is sacrificed on the cross, Jesus Christ is placed in the grave. He's placed in the grave for three days. Do you know what happens in three days to your internal organs? They begin decaying from the inside out. Jesus was decaying from the inside out. But on the third day, that which is imperishable goes back to eternity. Back to imperishability. Back to immortality. And you and I, who have hitched our wagons, who have become one with Christ, Join him in a death and resurrection like his. Thanks be to God. O oh, death, O oh, death, where is your sting? Victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is law. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? Reminds me of a, a powerful story, very simply stated, about the sting of death. It's about a father and a son who are traveling down the road, and as they're traveling down the road, the son who is deathly allergic to bee stings and needing to carry a epinephrine pen in order if they get stung. They're traveling down the road and all of a sudden a bee flies in to the car. Can you imagine the panic of that child? The panic of the child is, is extensive. For he knows that if he is stung by this bee, death is at its door. And many of us live life in a nervous wreck with great anxiety about death. And that death is at your door. And you will and I will receive the sting of death. But yet the father takes his hand out and grabs the bee. The father gets stung by the bee and reaches his hand out to his son and says, you will be fine, my dear child. But daddy, you got stung. Yes, I did, but you didn't. And you will be just fine. Oh, death, where is your sting? Christ takes the sting of death for you and I that we might not live in fear of that which is inevitable because the imperishable one became perishable. And on our behalf died a death and was raised from the dead that we will live an imperishable life with him. God's empty tomb says it this way, relax, my child. Relax, children of God. I have taken the sting of your death and you shall live forever. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. You want to circle that? You want to put that on a, a magnet if it will possibly stick to your stainless steel refrigerator? You want to laminate that and put it on your bathroom uh, mirror 
And dear friends in Christ, if you and I will but live in the victory that Christ has had, nothing will come against us. Nothing will win because Christ has already won the victory for us. The victory is secure because Jesus, the king of the kingdom, took on flesh and blood. The imperishable one became perishable for you. The venom and the poison of death has now has an antivenom, which is Christ who took the sting. We no longer, dear friends, need to live anxiety-ridden because Christ has won. How many of you are anxious? Oh, some of you are lying. <laughs> I am anxious right now. But I live in the truth and the power that Christ's victory is stronger than my anxiety. And when my anxiety gets big, I go, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ who has won, conquered, established dominion over my anxiety, over my death, over everything that's going on. Can you imagine the woman who came to Jesus and the anxiety that he, she had for her child? And Jesus says, I conquer it. Is she still going to be concerned for her child? Yes. Am I still going to be concerned for the church? Yes. But beloved in Christ, he has won the victory for you and I. Many of you all have gone to sporting events, and in those sporting events, in the last few minutes of the fourth quarter, you are probably singing, we are the champions, my friends. You never sing it in the first quarter. <laughs> you never sing it in the first quarter. You always sing it when you know who the victory is and who's going to win. Dear friends in Christ, that's what's the joy of living in the kingdom of God. We know who the victor is. And so can we live our lives in such a way that we can celebrate the victory of Jesus Christ day in and day out? The next piece of this passage goes on this. It says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Dear friends in Christ, that's living in the victory of who Christ is and what he's done. That's the reality of the funky thing called the church. As strange as it can be at times, we live with a confidence that other people don't live with. We live in the power that other people can't begin to comprehend because we have seen what God has done in our lives. We have seen what God has done in the church. We can see the peace of God which surpasses all understanding that takes peace for real. We are living in a culture right now that is strongly divided over mundane issues. We are all the children of God. Black, white, Asian, you name it. Gay, straight, transvestite, I don't care. We're all humans who God loves enormously can we live today right now in the victory of who Christ is 
in such a way that nothing will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Not a protester. Not an anti-protester. Not an ideology or another ideology, but the ideology that Jesus Christ is the victor. When we live that kind of way, the rest of the world looks at us and goes, hmm, I want some of that. Because we live life in a way that we can sing. We are the champions. Because he has done a great thing in the resurrection of the dead Will we begin to believe and live in it in such a way that we are free and free indeed because Christ has come into the world to ransom you and I who are perishable so that we might become imperishable with him. Amen.